You're watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs, first century gospel preaching for the 21st century. And welcome to this another edition of The Ancient Landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs and I'm so thankful to be with you and so glad that we have this opportunity to open up God's Word and to study and to learn from it once more. I'm so glad that you've tuned in, and it's always a pleasure and a privilege when uh, you invite me into your home that we might study from the book of God. I'm so thankful for this, and I hope that our time together will be beneficial and will be helpful. Certainly, whenever we're opening up God's Word and studying from the book of God, God's Word will not return to Him void. There is good that comes through and by the reading of Scripture, the studying of Scripture, and then taking that and applying it to our lives. What I'd like for us to do is, is read from Acts chapter 10 and also Acts chapter 11. As we consider the cases of conversion, here's a case of conversion in Acts chapter 10 and also Acts chapter 11. It's actually one case of conversion that's found there, but it uses or it, it requires us to read from two chapters. Somebody says, well, why is that? Well, as we're going to see, Acts chapter 10 discusses this case of conversion and, and gives us many facts, many things that were going on at the time that are, that are, um, are the truth and they're necessary for our learning. Chapter 11 is interesting because in chapter 11, the Bible says that Peter went back and Peter's involved, the Apostle Peter's involved in Acts chapter 10, but Peter went back in Acts chapter 11 and rehearsed the thing in order. In other words, in chronological order. So as you read Acts chapter 10, bear in mind that Acts chapter 11 presents it in its chronological order, and that's going to be very important as we study, uh, as we uh, get into this study a little bit more. But in Acts chapter 10, we read about the case of conversion when it uh, is talking about Cornelius. Now Cornelius was a Gentile. In fact, we're going to find that, Gen that Cornelius is the first Gentile convert. He is the first Gentile convert because he is the first one who was not a proselyte. He was not anything connected with the Jews. He just accepted Jesus Christ and he accepted the Lord's plan of salvation. And he accepted it. He was obedient to it. He became a Christian. But at the same time, he had not, before this time, he had not been a Jew or a proselyte or anything like that. And that's a key point. You know, sometimes people talk about the first Gentile convert, and you'll have people running back to Acts chapter 6 and other places say, well, you know, this guy over here, he was from another town, this guy was from another country, and whatever. Well, maybe so. But all those folks were either Jews by birth, like Saul of Tarsus, or who became the Apostle Paul. I mean, he was born in Tarsus. That's why they call him Saul of Tarsus. He was born in Tarsus, but both parents are, are Jews. So he was a Jew, full-blooded, if you will. He was a Jew, born as a Jew, born into the Hebrew nation. He was, that happened to him, and yet he was from another country. He wasn't a proselyte. He was a Jew. Then if you look on, you'll find others who are from other places. The Ethiopian eunuch, for example. The Ethiopian eunuch uh, was going to worship. Perhaps it was that he was from, since he was from Ethiopia, perhaps he was a proselyte. Or there might have been others who were that way. But if you're a proselyte of Jew, then you're still considered a Jew. To be a Gentile means this was an uncircumcised man. And that was the difference between a Jew and a, and a Gentile. And it's just as plain as form here is the difference between circumcision and uncircumcision. And you can also read about this in the book of Romans. Uh, that uh, book of Romans goes into great detail about that issue. Acts chapter 15 which we're only in Acts chapter 10, but if you go to Acts chapter 15, there's uh, no small stir over this circumcision, uncircumcision business and what God expects and, and following the plan of salvation and what it means to be saved and so forth. And here's an example of it. Here's this man, Cornelius, and the Bible says he's a Gentile. He was of the Italian regiment or the Italian band. He was a centurion. Now the word centurion simply means that he was a ruler of a hundred people. And he was a, a soldier, kind of like the centurion that was there at the cross. 
Now, I'm not saying Cornelius was there at the cross, but I'm saying that centurion was there at the cross. He was a leader of a hundred men. He was in charge of a hundred men there in his regiment. Well, Cornelius, who lived in Caesarea, was very much the same way. But Cornelius, the Bible says, was a very interesting man. It says that he was a devout man. He feared God with all his household. Acts chapter 10 tells us. He gave, alms, he gave alms to the people and prayed to God continually. Verse 2. Acts 10 verse 2. And so here's a man who is a good moral man, we might say. This man is somebody you would like to have as a neighbor. I promise you. Because here's a man, he was a devout man, he's a good guy, you know. He prayed to God always, he gave alms, he gave charity to those who were in need. Uh, he feared God with all his household. Imagine that. He feared God, and his whole household feared God. Imagine being a neighbor to somebody like that. Better yet, imagine if you were like that. See, there are, these are characteristics that I can take and certainly apply to my life. And I can certainly take them and, and consider them and, and learn from this man. But you know, as good as he was, and has, as he had a very high position in society, he'd been a centurion, uh, he was in Caesarea living there. He was a devout man. He feared God with his household. He gave alms to the people. And the Bible says that uh, he prayed to God. But you know, for all of those things, you know what this man lacked? You know what he was lacking where his life was, where there was uh, something missing from his life? You know what it was? Salvation. You know, for all of these things, as good as this man was, and as moral as he was, and as upright, and like I said, as much as you'd like for him to be a neighbor of yours, just as much as you'd like to, I would like to take, and, and that'd be a part of my life, the people would say, here's a devout man, and he prays to God, and he fears God, and, and, and is a giving person, you know, as, as much as I would want people to say that about me, and not because it wasn't true, but because it was true, as much as I'd like to live that kind of a life, you know morality alone won't save you. Just being a moral person is not enough. And I'm afraid a lot of times, at least we in our society, kind of have the idea that, well, if you can just be a good moral person, if you can be a nice person, if you can, you know, be good to other people and don't hurt anybody, you know, and, and pray to God and be a nice, generous type person, everything will be all right. Why, the good outweighs the bad and it'll be okay. You ever heard people talk like that? The good outweighs the bad, it'll be all right. No, 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 you can't think like that. And I can't think like that either. It's not a matter of good outweighing the bad. It is, am I a saved person or not? Are you a saved person or not? That's the question. See, and while I'm not trying to put down morality, that's not my point. Please understand, morality alone does not save, and Cornelius is about to learn that lesson. Because the Bible says about the ninth hour of the day, that's like three in the afternoon, about the ninth hour of the day, he saw in a vision. An angel of God came to him and said, Cornelius. He said to him, uh, uh, What is it, Lord? He said, Thy prayers and thine alms have come up to God for a memorial. Now, he said, Send men to Joppa and send for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. And the Bible says that that's exactly what he did when the angel... Uh, who spoke to him had departed. He called two of his servants, a devout soldier, and among those who attended with him and having related everything to them, sent them to Joppa. Well, if you remember back in Acts chapter 9, that's where we left Simon Peter. In Acts chapter 9, the last part of Acts chapter 9, he was in Joppa. He had traveled from Jerusalem to Lydda and finally over to Joppa, whose house is by the seaside, and if you can imagine, uh, you have Jerusalem kind of over here, and the Mediterranean Sea is over in this area over here. Jerusalem's over here. He's traveled from Jerusalem over to Lydda, over to Joppa, and it's over by the seaside over here by the Mediterranean Sea. Caesarea is north of there. And so they want to call for uh, Peter to travel north and go up to Caesarea. And so that's what that's about. And so now he is going to go there, or that he is going to be sent to him. But notice this. He says that uh, when, he, when he is told by this angel, he said, you need to send 
uh, men to Joppa and find Simon, he's going to tell thee what thou oughtest to do, what you must do. I'm going to tell you what you must do for what? See, for what? Well, what you must do to be saved. See, that's the point. He, you need to send them and they'll, they'll, so that Peter can tell you what to do to be saved. That's what's happening. See that? It's kind of like back in Acts chapter 9 and verse 6, whenever Saul of Tarsus is asked, uh, what must I do? Well, all right, well, same, and in fact, it's the same word, whether you're talking about must or ought, but it's the same word in the original. And so he says what you ought to do. He needs to do this if he's going to be saved. You mean to tell me that he's not a saved person already? You mean to tell me that he is not already saved and forgiven of his sins? You mean to tell me that somebody who is a good moral person and a nice person and a pleasant person to be around and who gives uh, freely and who offers prayers and who is devout and all of this, and he, he fears God, he respects God, see? You're telling me that someone who respects God is not a saved person? That's exactly what that's saying. Just because someone feared or respected God, just because you prayed a prayer, or just because you're a nice, kind person, that does not equal salvation. And Cornelius needed to know that. And I'm impressed with Cornelius because he did not fight this. He did not say, what do you mean? You mean I've been wasting all this time? You mean I've been wasting my time here uh, in the pursuit of God and you're telling me I haven't been saved this whole time? I thought I was saved the whole time. You notice he didn't fight this. He didn't argue. He says, I need to send men to Joppa and find out what to do. That's an honest man. And again, we see how that God is going to work to get the preacher and the sinner together. You've got to get the preacher and the sinner together. In every case of conversion, you find where man teaches another man. It is not where uh, God spoke to him, whispered in their ear, or whatever, made him feel a feeling, or whatever. It was man preaching or teaching man. That's what this was about. And that's what you're finding here. Uh, it would be very easy for the angel to say, uh, you know, your prayers have come up as a memorial before God, and I'm here to tell you what to do to be saved. So that'd been very easy to do, wouldn't it? And so it's not a matter of, of difficulty at all. It'd been very easy for an angel to say that and to do that, but that's not what God wanted. The angel said, you need to send men to, uh, to Joppa and find Simon, so named Peter, and get him and get him up here and let him teach you. That's what happened. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, the next day, it says, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter, the Bible says, went up to the housetop. Remember Simon the Tanner? And he was up on Simon, uh, Simon's rooftop up there. He was up there about the, it says about the sixth hour to pray. The sixth hour the next day, so that's like noon time. So this has all happened in, in the span of, of really less than, less than 12 hours, really. Because from, well, a little over, I'm sorry, a little over 24, wouldn't it? Uh, but from 3 in the afternoon, and now it's noon the next day. So now noon the next day, and it says that he went up and he was, he was hungry and he wanted something to eat. But as they were preparing it, he fell into a trance. And he saw the heavens open and something like a giant sheet descending and being let down from the four corners upon the earth, and in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air, and there came a voice, and here's what it said, here's what the voice said, it said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord. In other words, no way. I have never eaten anything that was common or unclean. The voice came unto him a second time and said, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. That happened three times, and then the thing was taken up into heaven. Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed, this is verse 17, while Peter was inwardly perplexed, in other words, he's wondering about this, what in the world is that sheep thing about? What in the world is those animals and that voice? What in the world have I just seen? While this is going on, the Bible says, Behold, men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate. And they called out as with Simon, who's called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Now, so far we've got an angel involved with Cornelius, sending men to Joppa. Now we've got a vision 
of Peter's. And now the Holy Spirit speaks to Peter and says, Behold, three men seek for thee. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. You go with them. And he said, I have sent them. And so Peter went down. He said, I'm the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? Verse 22, that's when they explain what we already know about. They're talking about Cornelius and he had this vision and such. And they said, he came and we need, to, we need you to come back with us. We want you to come back. And so they invited him. The next day, he arose and he went away with them. All right, so that was noon that day. The next, next day, he gets ready and goes. And those from Joppa Company. And they went there to Simon, I'm sorry, to Cornelius' house. When Peter entered, it says he fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up and he said, Stand up, I also am a man. And you know, that really impresses me right there. Whenever Cornelius sees him, Cornelius doesn't know any better than when he sees Peter fall down and worship him. And Peter stopped him. You know, there's a lot of folks today, or there have been folks today, and, and currently those who claim uh, a descendancy from Peter, and uh, they will accept worship. Now you think about that. Peter here does not accept worship, and he says, you stand up, I'm a man just like you. And he does not accept that worship. But you find folks today, and they call themselves the Pope, they call themselves the, uh, now they call themselves the Vicar of Christ. Used to they called themselves the Vicar of, of Peter. Now they call themselves the Vicar of Christ. And they're claiming that uh, descendancy and that lineage through Christ. I'm sorry, through Peter. And there's that descendancy or lineage through Peter. They're claiming that. And yet, guess what? They accept worship. And, they ex and in fact, they don't just accept it. They expect it from you. And that has been true all on down for many years. They expect worship. Not so with Peter. Not so with him. The apostle, he said, you stand up. I'm a man. Don't worship me. So you need to be worshiping God. And so that's what we all need to remember. You don't worship a man. You don't worship a group of men. We don't worship men. We worship God. He is the one that is worthy of our worship. And no one and nothing else. Now you look here and he says stand up. He talked with him. Found many there gathered in that place. And he said yourselves know. He said it's unlawful for me. He says it is unlawful for a Jew. Peter's a Jew. Unlawful for a Jew to associate or visit with one of another nation. Listen here. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Now, when did that happen? That happened. See, Peter was thinking about that vision. He was thinking about that dream. And he was perplexed about it, didn't understand it at first. But by the time he gets to Cornelius' house, it clicks. Now he knows. And he says, I shouldn't be calling any man common or unclean. I shouldn't do that. And he said, I'm not going to. You know, that's a lesson for us too. You ought not call a man common or unclean. Shame on people who judge others based upon their race. Shame on them for doing that. You should not be judging people based upon the race, the ethnic background, the skin color of another. That is wrong. And God shows us it's wrong. And if and if I didn't have any other passage in the world to show you but this one, Acts 10 proves it. I don't call any man common or unclean. I don't look down upon other men. Don't do that. You shouldn't do that based upon race, uh, ethnic background, nationality, skin color. Don't do that. And there's people who will say terrible, harmful, hurtful things to those of a different race from them. And that is wrong. It is wrong when a white man uh, calls a black man or a Chinese man, uh, you, know, uh, wrong, you know, racial slurs. That's wrong. And by the way, it's wrong when the black man and the Chinese man and, and whoever else uh, call white men by racial slurs. That's wrong also. Don't be doing that. 
And whatever side of the, I know I'm talking to a lot of people, and I know I'm talking to people from all nationalities and all races. God says we're all of one blood. Acts 17 says that we're all of one blood. And that being the case, we all are God's children. Just like the old song about uh, Jesus loves the little children. Remember that song, Jesus loves the little children, and says red and yellow, black and white, they're precious in his sight. Isn't that true? Sure it is. And by the way, Jesus loves little children, but Jesus loves the grown people too. And he loves you regardless of the race. And men ought to be ought not be so shallow that they are prejudiced against someone's race. And that's what this is about. He says, I don't I don't do that. Now, they did do it, and the Jews did do that, and the Jews did act that way. He said, but God has shown me I shouldn't be doing that. I don't do that. And so he says, here I am. He said, even though I understand that for me to be in the house with you, he said, that you know, people frown on that, to put it mildly. He said, it is unlawful for me. It's against the law what I'm doing. But God has shown me that I ought not call any man common or unclean. May we all learn that lesson. Don't call a man common or unclean based upon race and, and that type of thing, nationalities. That's wrong. And God shows us that. Well, as he moves on here, he says that, I, that from that time then, he said, Cornelius explains to him what was going on about the vision yet again. He hears about the vision once more that, that Cornelius had. And I've sent unto you, he said, Now hast well done that thou art come. And now, he said, are we all here uh, gathered? We are all here to hear all things commanded thee of God. Isn't that something? In Acts chapter 10, verse 33, we are here to hear. Let that sink in for a moment, folks. We are here, H-E-R-E, to hear, H-E-A-R. We are here to hear all things commanded of God. Or what about you? Are your ears tuned that way? I believe if you've been watching this program this long, and if you've been watching past programs and such, and all that, I believe you're here to hear. But I want us to understand that's a biggie right there. We are here to hear all things commanded thee of God. Why do that? Why be that way? Well, you need to be that way because, again, faith comes by hearing. Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's how faith is produced in the lives of people. We are here to hear all things commanded thee of God. We want it all. We don't want you to hold back anything. Don't give us any more. Or don't give us uh, more or less or anything else. Just give us just what God said. See that? And whenever I have just what God said, and I don't have anything more, anything less, anything else, I just have God's Word, it's going to produce faith. True Bible faith. And that's what I need if I'm going to be saved from my sins, because that's where it starts, and hearing God's Word producing the faith, that's where it begins. And then that produces repentance, and leads me to confession of Christ, and leads to baptism for the remission of sins. We're going to see that in this passage. And also that faith is what's going to keep me strong as I continue to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3.18. And isn't it interesting, the, the very same one who is there with Cornelius, the very same one who is there to tell all things commanded of God and going to tell them what's necessary to be saved, is the one who writes a letter later on, 2 Peter 3, he writes a letter later on that says what's necessary to stay saved. Grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, that's what's happening here. And that's what's being taught and shown right here in this passage, Acts chapter 10. And he says, that, that's what Cornelius said, we're all here to hear. All things commanded thee of God. He called together his kinsmen and near friends and they're all there. Because we want to hear the truth. We want to hear God's word spoken. We want to hear what God has to say. So those things being true then, what did he say? Well, what he said was, he then begins with the words of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. But in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. What does that mean? What is he talking about? 
Lord willing, on the other side of this break, we're going to talk about that. And we're going to open up Peter's sermon here. We're going to see what he had to say and see Cornelius and his family's response to it. And then later the Jews' response to Cornelius' response. And make some more applications to ourselves. So thankful that you're listening. You stay tuned and stay with me. And we're going to take a break. We're going to go and have a question. And on the other side of that question, we'll come back and conclude this study. So you stay tuned and we'll be right back. You're watching The Ancient Landmark. We invite you to visit with the Caneyville Church of Christ, meeting at 101 North Main Street in Caneyville, Kentucky. Visit our website at www.caneyvillechurchofchrist.com. Sunday morning Bible classes for all ages begin at 10 a.m. Sunday worship services begin at 10.45 a.m. and 5 p.m. Wednesday night Bible classes for all ages begin at 7 p.m. And tune in to our radio program, The Ancient Landmark, Monday through Friday from 1 to 1.30 p.m. on 99.9 FM WXMZ. Or listen live on the internet at www.vz. Dot voidstech.com Write to the Ancient Landmark, care of Jared Jacobs, 5695 Caneyville Road, Morgantown, Kentucky, 42261. For a free Bible correspondence course and a free subscription to the Old Pass, our teaching bulletin, The Ancient Landmark airs on Monday at 9 p.m., Tuesday at 1.30 p.m., Wednesday at 5 p.m., Thursday at 11 p.m., and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Our question at this time is asking, what is the purpose of miracles? You know, there's a lot of miracles recorded in the Bible, aren't there? And you can look to, uh, of course, Jesus walking on water, the healing of the sick, raising of dead people. You can talk about uh, the parting of the Red Sea, even to the granddaddy of all miracles, whenever the Lord spoke this world into existence. That was a miracle, because God just spoke, and there it was. He made all things, didn't he? And so, what is the purpose of miracles? That is a good question. You know, if you look around today, uh, you might find folks who are kind of like Simon. Simon tried to perform miracles. He tried to do little tricks and things. And the purpose for it was uh, that he might gain money. And he might have great gain and bewitch a lot of people. And so, if there was some way that you could have, um, you know, a miracle, a miraculous act that you could do... Uh, why you might make money off of it. You might gain uh, followers. You might be considered as somebody who can, uh, you know, someone who is, uh, you know, uh, godlike and what have you. But what is the purpose of miracles? What really do we see in Scripture? I suggest to you that we could look in the book of John chapter 2 and see the purpose of miracles. If you look in John chapter 2, we find in the beginning of, of the miracles that Jesus performed, the first one being at Cana of Galilee. In John chapter 2, it talks about how he turned water into wine. And the Bible says, though, that this first of his miracles, Jesus did at Cana of Galilee, John 2 verse 11, and it manifested his glory. Now watch this. And his disciples believed on him. Folks, the purpose of miracles is so that folks will believe. That's why Jesus performed these miracles. You look in John chapter 2, and now verse 23, and you'll see this once more. How that it says, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed on his name when they saw the signs he was doing. When folks saw what Jesus was doing, then they believed. Miracles were performed, whether Old Testament, New Testament, whenever. They were performed as that badge of authority. 
They were performed for the purpose that folks might believe the message that was being spoken. In fact, in the book of Exodus, you can look and, and find, you remember when God chose Moses to lead the people, that is in the early parts of the book of Exodus, that in Exodus uh, we find that God chose Moses and, for example, in chapter 4, Exodus chapter 4 is just one example of this, He's, when God chose him, he said, the people won't believe that you sent me. How am I going to prove that you have sent me? The Lord asked him in Exodus chapter 4 and verse number 2. He said, what is in thy hand? He said, uh, staff. He said, throw it on the ground. And he threw it on the ground. The Bible says it became a serpent. Moses ran away from it. And then God said, uh, put your hand out and, and grab a hold of that, that staff again. Grab that snake by the tail. And so he did, and when he did, the Bible says it became a staff once more. And then he, he goes on, the Bible says, and he says, put your hand in your coat. And so Moses does, he puts his hand inside his coat, and when he pulls it out, that hand is leprous. It's full of disease, it's leprosy. God tells him to put his hand back into his coat again, and he does, and he pulls it out, and his hand is clean. It is uh, whole again, it is healthy and that kind of thing. And what the Bible says that uh, if you would do that, God tells him, if you do that, the people will believe you. And so Moses had some miracles that he performed. And the purpose was so that people would believe. So whether you're looking in Old Testament, New Testament, that's the purpose for those miracles. And certainly that uh, the, the record of those miracles still holds true today. And the fact that we can read about the various miracles just uh, would certainly um, help to strengthen our faith. And uh, we find here that, of course, Bible faith today comes how? Romans 10, verse 17, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So, whenever I hear God's Word, and yes, I hear about the miracles performed by Moses, Jesus, the apostles, by different prophets, when I hear about those miracles, see, and I listen to what's being said, and I listen to the, how the God's power was expressed in those ways, it establishes and builds my faith in the God of heaven. Because I know He is the one who made these things. He's the one who made all of this possible. And He is the one who has loved me. He is the one who spoke this world into existence. He is the one who sent His Son to die. You think about Jesus Christ. Jesus, God, God in the flesh. Somebody says, how can God be in the flesh? Folks, God in the flesh, right there shows me if, nothing, if Jesus never performed a miracle, he was a walking miracle. And so all that being done so that we might believe. Yes, you need to believe as well. Believe the Bible, believe the truth, and live by it every day. And we're back again. We want to continue in our study of the book of God as we've been studying from Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11 and looking at the uh, conversion of Cornelius. Cornelius was a centurion, you remember, and a man who was well thought of and certainly a good moral person and an upright person in many ways. And yet the Bible says that the angel, God sent an angel to him to say, you need to send men to Joppa to find out what to do to be saved. And so he does, and because at Joppa, was, that's where Simon Peter was staying at the time. They go get Simon Peter. Simon Peter comes in, and he is made to understand that you ought not call any man common or unclean. He was made to understand that through that vision of that sheet-like thing with all the animals inside it. And when they said, rise Peter, kill and eat, he said, I'm not going to eat anything that's common or unclean. And, God, and the, the voice said, what God has cleansed, you don't call common. He didn't know what it meant till he was standing there before Cornelius. And, and he, as he was standing there in Cornelius' house, he said, I realize now. He said, God has shown me. I ought not call any man common or unclean. And with that, he begins preaching the gospel. And the Bible says he tells him, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness, the same is accepted with him. Now you look there in Acts chapter 10 and verse 34 and verse 35. Those words are true and those words really have been said a number of times. He that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. 
You remember that's what Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, when he said, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. See, and so what here is said by Peter in Acts chapter 10, verse 35, was the same thing Solomon had said in Ecclesiastes 12, 13. And it is, it is certainly words to live by. If you want to please God and you want to know the whole duty of man, the whole or man's all, what we're here for, he said you need to fear God, you need to keep his commandments. And that's what he tells Cornelius. Now Cornelius might argue and say, well, you know, I've been doing his commandments. No, he haven't done all of his commandments. You need to fear God, you need to keep what he has to say. And Cornelius has been lacking on some things. And... Someone says, well, it's out of ignorance that that was so. Perhaps it was out of ignorance. But, you know, ignorance is no excuse. Ignorance, uh, that doesn't help your case at all to say, well, I just didn't know. I just was ignorant. Well, there's ways to, there's ways to cure that, see. There's ways to solve that little problem. And so we need to remember that. And so you go back here in Acts chapter 10. And he says, he says as for the word, he says that he sent to Israel preaching the good news of peace, the gospel of peace, through Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. You yourselves what, know what happened throughout all of Judea. Be, and he says, beginning from Galilee after the baptism of John, he says, after the baptism of John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And we're witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree. Think about that. We're witnesses of the good he did. We're witnesses of all that Christ has done. He said, and then those folks put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him up the third day and made him appear, not to all people, but to us, uh, he says, who have been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him, who had, uh, and he says, after he rose from the dead. And they did eat and drink with him. The book of John records that, that they ate with him, they drank with him, he ate you know, fish and, with them, uh, honeycomb and, and various things, he ate and drank and so forth, and showed them he was very much alive, and there he was with them. They saw the nail prints, they saw the, the, the hole in his side where the spear had uh, thrust through his side and, and it pierced him as John 19 talks about. They saw those things. They were witnesses of this. Peter says this not only here, but also in the book of 1 Peter and talks about being a witness of Christ once more. But he says it here. And he says, And he commanded us to preach to the people to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of all the living and the dead. And to him the prof all the prophets bear witness, and everyone who believes in him receives the forgiveness of sins through his name. See that? He who believes on him receives the forgiveness of sins through his name. Well, what is done through his name? You go back to Matthew 28 and verse 19, and he said, There go ye therefore and teach all nations, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The things that was done through his name. You see? And so, he says, while Peter was saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. It says, and the believers, he says, from among the circumcised who had come with P Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, uh, he says, and then they were remained with him certain days. Now that takes you to the end of chapter 10. We go into chapter 11 here in just a moment. But I want us to notice here what's happened. Here where the preaching was done. The preaching of, of God's word was going on and they were hearing that. You go to Acts chapter 11 and you find that it's quite fascinating because when you look here, you see all the uh, same elements as before in, for, in Acts chapter 11. And he said how that he rehearsed this in order or in chronological order. He rehearsed this before the Jews. Because by the time Acts 11 comes around, in Acts 11, then Peter has gone back to Jerusalem 
And it says those people, the circumcision party, criticized him about this. And those people who said you had to be circumcised as well as keep the rest of the, the new covenant law and everything, but you had to have that flesh of circumcision also. You had to have that in order to be saved. And so he answers them. And he rehearsed it, the Bible says, in order. And so he goes through and talks about what had happened and the sheet-like thing again that he saw and the people who came and visited and so forth. And then back down to verse 15 of Acts 11. Acts 11 verse 15 is a key verse to help us understand Acts chapter 10. Because he says there in Acts 11 verse 15, As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as us at the beginning. So as he began to speak, and so the, the words that we saw here, the things that were, were said about, uh, you know, of a truth I perceive God is no respecter of persons, and every nation he that feareth him will work with righteousness is accepted with him. About the time he is saying those words there, that's the time the Holy Spirit falls on them. See, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell. And so, even though Acts chapter 10 is not in chronological order, Acts 11 is, and that helps us with this next section. Because, you see, we have people today who often say, well, uh, if you have someone who is uh, uh, going to be saved, then, or if they are saved, then the Holy Spirit comes on. And really, there's kind of two schools of thought, depending on who you're talking to, I guess. Some people take the Holy Spirit as, as evidence that you are saved, and some people would say, well, the Holy Spirit has to work on you in order to make you saved. See that? And either way is wrong because the Holy Spirit does not operate directly on you, me, or anybody. He doesn't work, operate in a direct manner uh, on you. And then here it says the Holy Spirit fell as on uh, them as on us at the beginning. But he says as I began to speak those things happened. But what's interesting is if you look at this, Acts chapter 10. Go back to Acts chapter 10 for a moment. Because he says when the Holy Spirit fell, it says it fell... The Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. It fell upon all who heard the word. Now, if it fell on all who heard the word, then who is the Holy Spirit falling on? Ah, see. Now, go back in Acts chapter 10. Go back. And when Peter leaves... The Bible says that when he arose, he went away and some of the brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Acts chapter 10, verse 23. There's some brethren from Joppa that come with Paul. And I don't know how many or anything like that. It just says some of the brethren from Joppa came with him. So here they are. So when Peter's in the house and he enters the house and, and all that, and Cornelius falls down and worships and all those things we've read about, there were brethren from Joppa watching this and observing what's going on. So they're in the house too. And then whenever the time comes and the Holy Spirit falls at the beginning, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit falls. Now jump in back to Acts chapter 10 and he says it fell on all who heard the word. The Holy Spirit, my friends, has fallen on saved people and unsaved people at the same time. See, so away with this idea that says, well, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit falling on somebody was a sign of salvation. Well, wait a minute. It can't be because it fell upon unsaved people. And if you think that they're saved people, they say, no, 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 those, those Gentiles are saved people now. That's why he fell on them. If you think they're saved people, then I'll bring you back to Acts eleven fifteen and remind you that it was as I began to speak. See, faith comes by hearing, and just as he started to speak, this all happened. If, if it's true that those folks were saved, then they were saved before faith, even. Are you ready to claim that? Are you ready to admit that? That you can be saved even without faith? Because that's what's happened. As I began to speak, Peter hadn't had time to get started yet. And then the Holy Spirit fell, and we're going to see why in just a moment. I haven't, still haven't told you why. The Bible tells you why. We haven't read down far enough yet to find out why, but we will. The Holy Spirit's fallen on them. They hadn't, had, they hadn't got time to hear it. They hadn't had time to believe. 
See, faith comes by hearing the word of God. They hadn't had time to believe. So that being the case, I ask you again, are they saved people now? Now I know the brethren from Joppa were saved people. They were brethren. But I'm talking about these Gentiles. The Holy Spirit's fallen on Jew and Gentile. Has fallen on saved and unsaved people at the same time. There's a reason for it. We just haven't got there yet. I want to make this point, though, very clear. Everybody with me? I know you are. You can see this. You can see it through a barrel with both ends knocked out. You can see this. And now, when it comes to the Holy Spirit falling on them, and it says they were all who heard the word, and the believers, says, from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. Even on them, they were amazed because the Holy Spirit's fallen and, and been given to them. Even on the Gentiles, see? Even on these unsaved people. And so here they're witnesses to it. And so Peter's a witness to it. These other men are witnesses to it. And they said, here they are. They can speak in other tongues. They can praise God. And by the way, to speak in, a, in other tongues just means other languages. That's all that means. And so they heard them speaking in another language rather than the lingua franca of the day uh, there at Caesarea. They were speaking in other languages now. And they heard that. See that? Now, as you continue on, then he says, well, uh, can any forbid water then that these should not be baptized? Can any forbid water now? In other words, is there somebody that's going to say they shouldn't be baptized? Is there someone that's going to deny them this opportunity to be baptized, to be saved, because they're not saved people yet, because baptism saves you. 1 Peter 3 and verse 21 says that. And, and by the way, 1 Peter 3 21 was written by Peter. Okay, so here it is again. So baptism saves you. And so he says, can any forbid water that to, not to, they might be baptized? In other words, they can be saved. Now, why was that so? Why did that happen? Why did the Holy Spirit fall? Well, it's interesting because the connection is made between this uh, event of the Holy Spirit here. You can see the connection between this, the sheet-like thing, the uh, angel speaking to Cornelius and that entire connection all the way through flows for one purpose and for one use. And the reason why you have these miracles and these events going on was so that you get the preacher and the sinner together. That's what you've done. See that? And there again, it would have been very easy if the Holy Spirit can inspire men's tongues to speak other languages... Don't you know it's just a snap of the finger for the Holy Spirit to inspire or to put in, in, uh, in the minds of Cornelius and his household to put in their minds the things necessary to be saved so that Peter doesn't have to say a word. You see where I'm going with this? Peter doesn't have to say it. If the Holy Spirit would just inspire and, and, and infuse it, as it were, just inspire them to know what it is necessary to be saved. But you know the Holy Spirit didn't do it. The Holy Spirit did not do that at all. Somebody says, how do you know he didn't do it? I know it because now we come back to Acts chapter 10 and all that long speech I read to you from Acts chapter 10 about verse 36 and down through verse 43, all that speech was given and was spoken to the, uh, I'm sorry, to Cornelius, to his household, to those Gentile people, that was preached to them after the Holy Spirit fell. Not before. After the Holy Spirit fell, after they're speaking in tongues, after they're praising and extolling God and all of that, after that event goes on, now the preaching is done so as to do what? To give faith to people, that Romans 10, 17, that they might then be, what, baptized for the remission of their sins. Why? Because in Mark 16, 16, he says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's why. See that? Now, isn't that fascinating? That all fits together just like a big puzzle piece, doesn't it? And whenever I put, that's why I said we had to read Acts chapter 11. Because Acts chapter 11, in its place, in chronological order, we see that that, that event 
of the Holy Spirit falling and all of that taking place right there, it actually comes before the preaching. And so you put it back in its preaching spot and you see we still got unsaved people, but the purpose of it was to make sure we understood that the preacher and the sinner need to get together and let the preacher tell the sinners what to do to be saved. The Holy Spirit didn't do it. Now, you want to know why it is? Why well, did the Holy Spirit fall? Well, we told you part of it. I'll read the rest to you from Acts 11 and verse 18. In Acts chapter 11 and the verse of number 18, he says, after, now this is after Peter expounds this in chronological order. Down one, two, three, four, just walking him right down through what had happened. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us, just as us at the beginning. And I remembered, he said, the words of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, he said, but you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If the Lord, or if God, he says, gave them the same gift to, us, gave to them as he gave to us who believe in the Lord Jesus, who was I that I should withstand God? In other words, there's too much evidence here. There is too much overwhelming evidence that this is exactly what God wants. He wants all men to be saved, not just a few, not just some, but all men to be saved from all corners of the world and all corners of the earth. And he said, this is exactly what's going on. Now jump to verse 18. When they heard this, now remember, this was the circumcision party people. This is the, the sect, the sect of, of people that were uh, saying he had to keep uh, the, uh, well, keep circumcision as well as keep what the Lord said in the New Covenant. He said you had to do both things. And here they, they fell silent. In other words, they shut up. And it says, they glorified God, saying, then, hath the, uh, then to the Gentiles God has granted repentance unto life. And isn't that fascinating? They understood that when the Holy Spirit fell, this was the sign. This was the signal. This was the point that they say we recognize God has granted unto the Gentiles repentance unto life. Now folks, this chapter here in Acts chapter 10 and Acts chapter 11, this account, this event, this case of conversion means much. And it means a great deal more to us, I hope, than perhaps we thought before, but I want you to understand, this means a great deal to us because uh, I'm a Gentile and you're a Gentile. There, uh, this, this country of America is pretty much all Gentiles. And really, uh, so far as the, the Western Hemisphere to a, great, uh, to a great degree, we're Gentiles. See that? And so the, the Jewish nation itself, even in the first century, the Jewish nation itself was very limited. There wasn't a whole lot in comparison with the world population. There wasn't a great percentage of people that were the Jewish people. But God granted to the Gentiles repentance unto life. In other words, God wants salvation for everyone and for everyone in the world. God wants His salvation. He wants the word preached. He wants the message, His message, sent forth and then folks to, to believe it and to be saved. And that includes you and that includes me and this passage shows it. What Jesus had said in Mark 16, 16, and verse 15, first of all, Mark 16, verse 15, going to all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. What God had said, what Christ had said that day was being fulfilled in Acts 10. It's being fulfilled right here, folks. And from this point forward, and we'll see that Saul, who becomes the Apostle Paul, we'll see the Apostle Paul go to the Gentiles. He goes to them as well because God wants this message, this gospel plan of salvation. He wants it preached and taught to everyone, to all corners of the earth. And that's why we have, uh, that's why we do what we do today. That's why the Caneville Church of Christ is so active and making sure the Word of God gets out. We've got radio programs and we've got a website, CaneyvilleChurchOfChrist.com. We've got uh, uh, YouTube videos. We've got all of these things so that people all over the world can hear the truth, can believe it, and can obey it. Not to the glory of man, but to the glory of God. 
And that's what we need to see here. We recognize. Did you notice that, that after Peter came back and after he explained it and after he told them what was going on, Acts 11, 18, they glorified God over that. Now we see that God hath granted to the Gentiles repentance unto life. And you come back here in this passage and that's exactly what the point was. That was the point with the angel. That was the point with the vision. That's the point with the Holy Spirit. Those three miracles, those supernatural events which took place, the, res the reason for it was so we understand that Gentiles get repentance unto life, that all people need to hear the gospel and be saved, and that Peter was the first one to do it. And, and you'll find also, you tie this in with Acts 15, and you also tie it in with Matthew 16 and verse number 19, and you're going to see this event is actually all, is also an, an actual fulfillment of prophecy. You see, God, Christ told Peter, I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And he goes on and says, Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. If you pay real close attention in Matthew 18 verse 18, the second half of that promise was given to all the apostles. But the key, where it says, I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, that promise was given only to Peter. And so you go to Acts chapter 2, and as it were, he takes the key and opens the door to the Jews. Men and brethren, what shall we do? And they said, after they heard this, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter said, repent and be baptized. Now you've come to the Gentiles. And now here he has the key again, as it were, and he unlocks that door for the Gentiles because he goes in and the Holy Spirit falls and he knows this is the thing to do. This is right. This is God's uh, sent. This is by God's command. And so he preaches the gospel and he comes and can any forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? And they took them and commanded them to be baptized. Sometimes folks argue that baptism is not a command. We read Acts 10, 48. It was a command. He commanded them to be baptized. And they were baptized. And the reason for being baptized is baptized for the remission of sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. And so here's, here these folks have been converted. Not only Cornelius, but his whole household. His kinsmen, his near friends. I, I see in my mind a packed house. I see in my mind uh, full, all the chairs filled, the floor is filled, all the, the house there is all filled up, and now we want to hear. And the Holy Spirit fell on all them, Jews and Gentiles and all, and then he preached to them, and having heard the word, they believed that word, Romans ten seventeen, and he said, we can baptize you, and commanded them to do so. Have you obeyed that command yet? Are you, have you been baptized for the remission of your sins based upon your faith in Christ and your repentance of your sins? Have you done that? If not, why not? What's keeping you from it? I hope that you won't delay anymore. I hope that if you will, you'll contact me. We'll talk about this. And we'll, we'll see, and, and I hope you've already seen, that this is exactly what God wants to do, and I'll be glad to baptize you into Christ. Oh, not for my glory, but for the glory of God. And then you live for Him. Not for your own glory, but for the glory of God. That's what Cornelius did, and that's what these folks did. That's what the apostles did. You think about that, and you, we'll, we'll get serious about it. Anytime you want to study, you call me. You want to study, you want to learn God's Word, contact me. And let's talk about it, and let's make sure we do, and follow exactly what the Lord said, just like these folks did. I know you're here to hear, or you wouldn't be listening right now, and I'm glad you have heard. I appreciate your attention, and I hope that this has been helpful to you. Contact me. Let's talk about these things and study them together. I'd love to hear from you. So thankful for this time, and so thankful for this opportunity to study, and I am thank you for tuning in. Until next time, Lord willing, we bid you good day. You've been watching The Ancient Landmark. Tune in weekly on Monday at 9 p.m., Tuesday, 1.30 p.m., Wednesday, 5 p.m., Thursday at 11 p.m., or Friday at 9.30 a.m. Write to The Ancient Landmark, care of Jared Jacobs, 5695 Caneyville Road, Morgantown, Kentucky, 42261.